Good morning, good morning, good morning to you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogue. This is Monday Motivation, Monday Motivation, and I want to first of all say hallelujah, it is Monday, it is a good day to be alive it is a good day to be awake uh it is a good day to be in the presence of god it is a good day regardless of what is going on around us so um i've had a pretty eventful weekend myself and um i got a surprise on friday um, after we covered our finance and wealth broadcast where we were talking about some hard issues and some difficult issues um, that someone uh, actually blessed my family with some stocks and bonds. So that was a, a pretty amazing Friday for me and i um, very excited about that uh, unexpected blessing that came. And so I just want to encourage you, for those of you all, as we talked about on Friday, for those of you all who are um, seeking to get your finances right, seeking to, um, you know, be good stewards over the monies that you do have and seeking ways to expand and increase your income. Again, I want to encourage you to, um, you know, if you're getting tax return money, you should be thinking now about what you're going to do, how you're going to save it, what kinds of CDs you're going to uh, invest in, what kind of stocks, what kind of bonds. Um, also, you can go to Kitco, Kitco, K-I-T-C-O, Kitco.com to invest in precious metals there. So I just wanted to um, reiterate that and just say that even while we were yet speaking on the subject, God was doing something surprising in my own financial planning so um, I just thank God for that good news and also this weekend I got a chance to uh, do what I call investing in people investing in people and pouring into people through my activate the author in you uh, first conference in this DMV area and it was a small turnout because of the weather but we got some really good, valuable information to those participants as well as, um, you know, got them activated in their writing and thinking about what they're going to put out into the world as an author. And it was just a really good, phenomenal time. Everybody was hungry for the information. People were ready to receive. And that is what we like to experience and hear. So um, if you are interested in hosting and activate the author in you workshop in your region, you can feel free to contact me at reachshante at gmail.com. My email is in the bio and we cover everything from marketing to um, book cover design to understanding the publishing industry um, to um, how to get your books noticed for international uh, acclaim. And so um, those are things that I offer as a professional and the team that I work with, the other per, the other authors and professionals that I work with would be happy to come and host a workshop with your organization or with your author's group, your reading group, or with your business or ministry. So I uh, just wanted to let you know about that as well. So much has been going on this past weekend. I know a lot of people were tuned in to the Oscars, right? And um, that's definitely motivation in many ways for um, those of you who are operating in your respective professions. Um, I do not watch television, but I did get lots of uh, snippets and tidbits, and I read a couple of articles on some of the things that happened that were inspiring on yesterday um, in terms of you know people who have been working a long time in their field such as actress Viola Davis who um, won the award for best supporting actress but she also 
um, made a major milestone as the first African American actress to get a Emmy, I think they said an Oscar and a Tony, um, which is the three that you can get on the acting on the acting side. And of course, there's also the Grammy for the music side. And so um, that was a huge accomplishment for her. I know uh, someone was saying that Whoopi Goldberg also earned for the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, and the Tony, but hers was not necessarily um, all in acting. So that was the difference there. Also, um, I believe Moonlight won for Best Picture. Um, and although I don't necessarily agree with the content of Moonlight, I know that for that team that it was um, a surprise. It was an unexpected win for them. Um, and everybody else was kind of banking on another movie to get it. But that movie actually did bring some attention to Liberty City, which is around the, around the area that um, I come from. I think Liberty City is maybe about 45 minutes from where I used to live. Um, so it brought some light onto Liberty City. It brought some light onto my alumni school, Florida State University, because I believe either the director or the playwright, one of them was a graduate of Florida State University. So it brought a lot of positive light to the state of Florida. And, um, you know, it was something that the gentleman who produced the movie, he did not expect. Um, and the budget, I believe, on the movie was very, very low. And so for them to come out and to win uh, for Best Picture was pretty amazing. Um, and it, I would hope that it would give lots of people inspiration and motivation that whatever you're doing, even if it seems like you are the underdog in it, to keep going and to do it because you feel that you are called to do it. You feel that you are completing something that is of importance for your own life, right? And so I think that overall, there were pretty good things that came out of those who did win something uh, during the Oscars awards. Something to encourage you, something to be inspired by. And of course, I know that there was some humor made because Moonlight was not announced first. They announced another movie and then they had to come back and say, oops, we announced the wrong winner. So sometimes that may happen in your life. Sometimes you may think that um, you lost when actually there's been a mistake and you actually won instead. So I just encourage you that whatever you're involved in to make sure that you keep going. Um, I know that I'm a self-motivated person, that what I do is not predicated upon whether or not somebody is going to approve of it or whether somebody's going to give me a pat on the back, or whether somebody's going to give me a high five. I'm doing it because I feel compelled to do it and also because I want to please God with my life. So I would encourage you to keep going. If you find yourself going off kilter or you find yourself off focus this week, understand that your motivation has got to be internal. It can't just be external things that motivate you to do what it is that you're doing. All right. So today we're going to get back into our reading of Tony Evans' Detours, and we're on Chapter 9, The Pardon of Detours, The Pardon of Detours. Remember, Detours is all about Tony Evans' perspective of what he has learned about the life of Joseph through Joseph's Detours. Tomorrow, we will be back in getting serious about getting married. We're going to continue um, talking about relationships and marriage and preparing for marriage and uh, what happens in the concept of singleness and singlehood. And I've actually got some very, very interesting things to share with you on tomorrow and some phenomenal testimonies I've heard uh, over the weekend as well about engagements. So I want to um, put a plug in for tomorrow at 11 a.m. We'll be talking about relationships and I hope that you will join us then. All right, so let's get into the pardon of detours and then at the end of this reading I do have a giveaway. 
I do have a giveaway today. Um, and I'll tell you how you can participate in today's giveaway at the end of our reading. All right, so I hope you've got something to drink. I've got something to drink here. And here we go. The Pardon of Detours. Two monks were on their way to a particular destination. On their way, they had to cross a shallow river to get to where they were going. But when they reached the river, they ran across an elderly, heavyset woman sitting by the bank of the river. She sat there crying, and so the two monks, <clears throat> the two monks asked her what was wrong. She proceeded to tell them that she was unable to cross the river. She was too scared to go out in it all alone. The two monks had sympathy for the elderly lady, so they offered to carry her across the river. Together, they picked her up and proceeded to wade into the water, gently getting themselves and her across to the other side. Once they made it to the other side, the elderly woman thanked them profusely and then went on her way. The two monks continued on to their destination. Yet, as they were walking, one of the monks started to complain about the pain in his back. He mumbled, Wow, carrying that woman across the river was really difficult. Now my back is hurting so bad. The other monk answered his complaint with encouragement. Well, let's keep going. You can make it. No, the complaining monk retorted. I can't. I can't go on. Carrying that woman was hard. I'm hurting too bad. The monk paused and then asked his friend, No, aren't you hurting too? To which the other monk replied, No, I got rid of her five miles ago. <laughs> oh my goodness. A lot of us are failing to reach our destinations because we are still feeling loaded by the pain of the past. The weight of yesterday continues to weigh us down today, keeping us from moving freely into tomorrow. Nothing, and I mean nothing, will hinder you arriving at your destiny like this thing called unforgiveness. Unforgiveness includes holding on to past pain, past hurt, or past grudges. The weightiness of regret, remorse, and revenge. Unforgiveness is that one thing above all else that will block God's movement in your life, taking you from where you are to where you are supposed to go. When you hang on to the weight of yesterday, it will hinder the progress of tomorrow. Unforgiveness is the critical area that must be addressed if you're going to reach your destiny. If anyone had a right to be angry, bitter, and to hold a grudge, it was Joseph. Joseph grew up in a dysfunctional family under a dysfunctional father, was dumped in a pit, sold into slavery, unjustly jailed, and then forgiven, forgotten, excuse me. If anyone had a right to be angry and to say life is not fair, it was Joseph. Now, put some hearts on the screen. If you know someone that lives in the life is not fair zone, If you know someone that lives in the life is not fair zone, put some hearts on the screen. None of you do? Great. Okay. Because there are some people that cannot move forward in their life because everything that they talk about, right? Or everything that they're involved in ultimately leads to this conversation about life not being fair. Right? We see it all the time. I know I do. I run into at least one to two people a day that fit the life is not fair category or life is not fair zone. Anytime, anything you ask them about their future and what they're doing in the future it turns into a life is not fair conversation. And at some point, yes, we understand that certain people groups in this country, especially, have been marginalized. But at some point, there are things that you can do to empower yourself. You don't have to wait for someone 
to empower you. We live in the age of information that literally anything you pretty much want to find out how to do, you can find out for yourself. If it's something that needs fixing, you can literally Google it or YouTube it and type in how to fix X, Y, and Z. And you can get the instructions. So we're living in a day and age where life is not fair and that mentality is not going to cut it. Because there's too many opportunities that you can begin to create for yourself. And there's too much knowledge available to release you from one of the greatest obstacles to moving forward. And that is lack of knowledge. So we're living in a day and an age where we cannot just say, I don't know. What do we do after I don't know? After we, after we realize I don't know, then we have to move to the action of finding out what we don't know. And a lot of people get stuck on, I don't know. This happens a lot in uh, social media world. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, <laughs> that annoys me more. Then someone who comes on my page asking me 20 to 25 questions when all they have to do is Google and find the answer. I know I'm an instructor, I'm an educator, but some things you really can find the information for yourself. Because again, as I've stated before, when we find the information ourselves and we read it ourselves from the source that we found we will have more confidence in what it is that we're learning, not just taking the word of someone else for it. And so a lot of times, you know, people get upset with me when I say, do your research or when I say, Google it. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to send you on your own path of self-discovery, your own path of seeking knowledge so that when you find what you're looking for, you will know that it's actually there, that you read it for yourself, that you looked at the source of it, and that you don't have to go back and argue with me about whether or not you trust me as the presenter of the information when you have read it from the original source. So, again, life is not fair. That notion, at some point, people are going to have to move past it. We know Life is not fair, but we serve a just God and we serve a God of grace and we serve a God of favor. So where life is not fair, this is what I do. I say, God, this is not fair. This is not right. But I trust that you are going to be the God of justice and handle your business. And I trust that you're going to be the God of grace and favor and give me the grace that I need to complete whatever it is I'm completing. And give me the favor with the right people that I'm going to need to come into contact with. When they encounter me, I'm going to receive favor. They may have hated everybody else. <laughs> but God, I am trusting you to give me favor in this situation. And you know what God does? He answers that prayer. He gives me favor in situations where I know good and well these people did not want to receive me, accept me, or like me. But the favor of God was upon my life and God managed to open the door even through people who did not like me. So I'm thankful for that. All right. So let's go back to our reading. The life of Joseph fills the pages from chapter 37 to chapter 50 of Genesis so it is obvious that God wanted us to learn from this man he wanted us to zero in on this man's life's lessons and I actually agree with Tony Evans on that I spent three years studying the life of Joseph and I learned a lot I learned a lot but even in reading Tony Evans book I'm still learning so much more God gave so much of the first book of the Bible to Joseph because he wanted to show us the key components to living a life of destiny. And one of those critical components Joseph had to grapple with and that you and I will have to grapple with if we are ever going to get off of our detours and arrive at God's designed destiny for our life is this issue of forgiveness. Joseph had to face it. 
He had to deal with it. In fact, we see this acknowledged in Genesis 50 through 17. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Genesis 50, 15 through 17. You got an iPad, you can plug it in there and pull it up. Genesis 50 through 17, 50, Genesis 50, excuse me, 15 through 17. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, if Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering we've caused him. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before he died, your father gave a command. Say this to Joseph. Please forgive your brother's transgressions and their sin, the suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when their message came to him. He wept. Joseph's response lets us know that he had not grown emotionally cold. He had not chosen a life of cynicism in dealing with the pain that he faced. He still allowed himself to feel deeply despite the losses that had occurred in his life. He hadn't cut off the past. Rather, he had learned how to view the past. That is so good. That is so good. I often hear people say, um, forgive and forget. No, no, no. I'm going to forgive, but I'm never going to forget the things that have occurred in my life. Why? Why would I encourage you not to forget? Because when I remember, number one, it helps me to stay in touch with people who are going through those same things now. When I remember the pain of what I felt, doesn't mean I live in the pain, but it helps me to be empathetic to people who may be going through similar situations. I don't ever want to lose my compassion or my empathy for somebody in a, in a bad situation to the point where I have forgotten what it felt like to be in that situation. All right. But again, as Tony Evans says, you don't necessarily forget your past. You don't forget your pain, but you learn how to view it. You learn how to view it through the correct lens. You don't, you don't view it through the lens of anger. You don't view it through the lens of bitterness. You don't view it through the lens of revenge. You don't view it through the lens of a grudge holder, right? You learn how to view the things of your past through the proper lens. And part of that proper lens is forgiveness. So no, I don't plan on forgetting what happened to me in the past. Matter of fact, praise God, I plan on uh, making some money off of it in the future. Because <laughs> I'm going to write about it. So you don't necessarily have to forget your past. What you have to do is you have to learn how to view your past even as Joseph did. He said, you all meant it for evil but God meant it for my good. What's the song say? Travis Green song. It's intent. He's intentional. He's never failing. All things. He got it from Romans 8, 28. All things are working for my good. My goods, my bads, my pains, my, my problems, my um, physical health problem, whatever it is. All things are working for my good. Doesn't mean they were all good. But it means that when I add good plus bad plus bad plus bad plus bad plus good, it will equal all good. All right. So he learned how to view it. But you could tell that his brothers were still caught in their guilt. This is why years later, they're already in Egypt. Joseph is already providing for their family etc etc they've moved their families over and they're still fearful they're still fearful that at some point Joseph is going to come back and exact revenge on them for something they did by this point 30 years ago maybe even longer but they're still caught in the guilt of what they enacted on their brother so out of that guilt and out of that fear 
they concoct a, you know, oh, this is how we'll get Joseph to forgive us because we'll tell him what daddy said to do. Because we know that Joseph loved dad. So if we tell him that daddy said to forgive us, then Joseph will forgive us. Anybody have siblings that, that try to use what your parents say to convince you to do something? This is where they were. Grown men still saying, well, daddy said to forgive us, so you got to forgive us. Not realizing that Joseph had already made up his mind to forgive them. He had learned how to accept it in alignment with God's providence. So the things that happened to Joseph, Joseph learned how to accept it in alignment with God's providence. Even though the pain was obviously still there. Forgiveness doesn't mean you no longer feel pain, nor does it mean to forget the facts about what happened. Forgiveness means you no longer hold the situation or person hostage for the pain they caused.